Let's talk about Rocket Lab, because as fun as it is to throw shade at companies like Boeing that are failing miserably in this new era of spaceflight, it's probably a better use of our time to hype up some folks who are doing really cool, innovative things with aerospace design, and Rocket Lab are exactly those kinds of people. So today we're going to take a look at what this company is up to right now and what their plans are looking like for the future. They are working on some really cool stuff right now and it's going to be fun to talk about and I am going to make a point in this one of not drawing any comparisons to uh, you know who. This is all about Rocket Lab today, so let's get going. This is the Space Race. So a quick bit of history here. Rocket Lab was founded back in 2006 by a New Zealand engineer named Peter Beck, who remains in charge of the company to this day as CEO and Chief Technical Officer. The company managed their first rocket launch in 2009, becoming the first private company in the Southern Hemisphere to reach space. They fired a small, pencil-shaped rocket into suborbital space from what appears to be the banks of the Brandywine River in Middle Earth. It was pretty neat. After that, things started to get real for Rocket Lab. In December 2010, Rocket Lab was awarded a U.S. government contract from the Operationally Responsive Space Office to study a low-cost space launcher to place CubeSats into orbit. Those are tiny little research satellites. And that's the kind of niche that the company decided they would settle into at the time. Small, low-cost launch vehicles for small payloads. Beck has said publicly that Rocket Lab had no intention of making big rockets or exploring reusable boosters. In 2013, the company moved their registration from New Zealand to the United States and opened their first headquarters in California. Their current head office is in Long Beach. Also in 2013, Rocket Lab had completed the design on their own proprietary rocket engine, the Rutherford engine, named for the New Zealand-born nuclear physicist Ernest Rutherford. This is a small kerosene burning rocket engine that was designed to be as simple and cheap to produce as possible. And to achieve this, Rocket Lab came up with a method to fabricate most of the components by 3D printing. Using the electron beam melting method, the combustion chamber, injectors, pumps, and main propellant valves of the Rutherford are all 3D printed. It was the first rocket engine built in this way, and I'm pretty sure still the only one. Nine Rutherford engines power Rocket Lab's first orbital launch vehicle, the Electron. This is a small, lightweight rocket with a modest capacity of delivering 150 kilograms to a 500 kilometer altitude. By no means a heavy lifter, but it's a good niche for the ever-growing small satellite market. The first flight for Electron in 2016 was mostly successful. The liftoff and ascent went just fine, but at an altitude of 224 kilometers, the ground station lost telemetry communication with the rocket, and they chose to destroy the Electron in the air just to be safe. On its second launch in 2018, which Rocket Lab named still testing, the Electron made it into orbit and successfully deployed its first payload of three CubeSats and one giant disco ball called Humanity Star. I don't really know what's the point of the disco ball, but it's cool. The body of the Electron is a carbon composite material that keeps the vehicle very lightweight and allows for a very short production time. By 2019, Rocket Lab had developed an automated production process that they named Rosie the Robot after the maid character in the Jetsons cartoon. Rosie can make all the carbon fiber structures for Electron, as well as handle cutting, drilling, and sanding the parts for final assembly. The company objective as of November 2019 is to reduce the overall Electron manufacturing cycle to just seven days. Also in 2019, Peter Beck announced that he had changed his mind about reusable boosters and Rocket Lab were pursuing recovery and reflight plans for the first stage of Electron. The idea is to help deploy a parachute to slow the descent of the booster stage down to the point where a helicopter can catch it in mid-air. Because the Electron is so small and made of that super light carbon composite, this method actually makes a ton of sense. So far, Rocket Lab has been able to parachute the booster down for an ocean landing, and they've run test flights on the helicopter interception as well. 
The plan is for 2022 to bring those together and make a successful catch. In 2021, Peter Beck also announced that he had changed his mind again and unveiled Rocket Lab's plan to build a bigger rocket. To prove the point to everyone watching that he was not afraid to admit he was wrong, Beck made the grand gesture of literally eating his hat during the announcement video. He dropped a company hat into a blender and chewed on some of the shards that came out. Now, obviously, this was more of a publicity stunt than anything. It did generate some good headlines, just like Rocket Lab knew it would, but it does send a message to the aerospace industry. Imagine how much more progress we would be making right now if certain companies would just admit they were wrong, eat their hat, swallow their pride, and change course to a better idea. Boeing, I'm looking at you. And that brings us to the really good stuff, the Neutron rocket. This is Rocket Lab's vision for the launch vehicle of the future, and they are developing it today. The Neutron is designed totally to be as economical as possible. It's a fully reusable first stage booster with reusable fairings. Those are the covers on the top that protect the payload. While other rockets jettison the fairings in space and allow them to fall away, the Neutron fairings open up in a four pedal design. Wait for the second stage to depart and then close up again. By using four parts, that allows for the shortest range of motion in the fairing mechanism with the largest clearance diameter. Then the booster comes back down to earth and lands propulsively on solid ground looking the exact same as it did when it launched. The fully reusable capacity for the Neutron is 8 tons to low earth orbit. Beck has said that the number one constraint the design team gave themselves was that the booster had to be able to be turned around and relaunched in 24 hours. And that constraint forced them to drive down cost to the lowest level possible and thereby maximize the efficiency of the entire launch and landing process. So just like the Electron, Neutron is a fully carbon composite body. That means it is super lightweight while also being super strong. Beck did a fun demonstration during the Neutron update video where he used a battering ram to smash a sheet of stainless steel, which dented horribly. Then he smashed a sheet of aluminum, which also dented. Then, you guessed it, he smashed a sheet of the Rocket Lab carbon fiber, which held strong against the ram. It's not exactly a fair test for a number of reasons, but it is great showmanship and he gets the point across. Beck's rockets are not built like other rockets. They are something new and different. Beck has said that Rocket Lab is upping their carbon composite manufacturing to the point where they are able to produce several meters of material per minute. Beck claims that thanks to their automation, Rocket Lab has an incredibly reliable and accurate carbon composite production that is also fast and cost effective. So he's taking all the right boxes. The odd shape for the neutron body is a consequence of being designed for re-entry. The fact that it's wider at the base and narrow at the top is the same idea as the crew capsule that we use to get people back to Earth from space. This design prevents air pressure and shock waves from building up on the sides of the vehicle, while also using the atmosphere to slow the thing down as it descends. With its big base and low weight, the neutron will come down almost as if it had a small parachute. And because of this, the engines won't need to perform a re-entry burn at all. Once the second stage is deployed, the Neutron uses cold gas thrusters to flip around and then performs one boost back burn from the main engines to slow down enough for re-entry. Then the descent back through the atmosphere is controlled by small fins near the top of the booster. And finally, the main engines fire again for a landing burn to come in for a soft touchdown on a pad. The big fins at the bottom serve as a wide, solid base for the rocket to land on. Beck says he spent weeks trying to solve the problem of a mechanism for the landing legs before he decided that landing legs suck and he could just avoid them entirely. There are just small shock absorbers built into the tips of each base fin. We also know that the reason Rocket Lab is only looking at ground landings and helicopter catches for their rockets is all about cost. Beck has said in multiple interviews that the sheer cost of landing a rocket on a barge in the ocean is just too much for the company to justify. He's called marine assets horrifically expensive to operate and stressed that Rocket Lab will avoid marine operations at all costs. 
The company even cut back their ground-based facilities to absolute bare minimum. The Neutron will be built at the same location where it is launched, so the rocket never has to be transported on public roads, it never even has to be tipped over onto its side. It stays vertical. And Neutron won't even have a launch tower. The umbilical connections for propellant attach from the launch mount and fill the entire rocket from below. There are pipes inside those large side fins that run up from the base to connect with the second stage and fill its tanks with propellant as well. The Neutron is powered by a whole new engine design, the Archimedes, named after the ancient Greek mathematician, physicist, engineer, and astronomer who lived more than 200 years BC. There are seven engines in the booster stage and one vacuum-optimized variant of the same engine in the second stage. Beck stresses that there is nothing special about the Archimedes, and Rocket Lab were actively trying to build the most boring engine ever. It's not super powerful or high pressure or anything fancy, and it doesn't have to be, because Rocket Lab has put the design focus into the body of the Neutron, making it so lightweight and strong and aerodynamic, they don't need an extraordinary engine to power it. Archimedes burns liquid methane fuel because it is the cleanest and most rapidly reusable option, burning kerosene leaves a ton of residue and soot inside the engine, and it needs to be cleaned out between flights. That would prevent the booster from meeting its 24-hour turnaround window. By burning clean fuel at a modest pressure with a modest amount of thrust, the engine can be fast and cheap to build with a very high safety factor and still hold up to multiple reflights without maintenance. Just a reusable workhorse of an engine. By targeting 8 tons capacity to low Earth orbit, Rocket Lab is putting Neutron right in the sweet spot for the majority of satellite launches. It's nowhere near the lift capabilities of some other well-known rockets, but it doesn't have to be. Beck says that the majority of rocket launches fly well below their max capacity, and there is no discount for not filling the rocket. You don't pay by kilo for a satellite launch. So the most affordable option for most small satellite launches is to ride share. You find a launch that's already been funded and arranged, and you just buy some of that extra space inside the rocket fairing for your satellite. But that's not an ideal solution for most customers. You don't get control over the timeline for launch or the destination for the rocket. You can ride share on a flight that is going pretty close to your optimal orbit position, but you're probably not going to get where you really want to go. With a small launch vehicle like the Electron and eventually a bigger option with the Neutron, Rocket Lab are giving small satellite operators an affordable and reliable option to launch on their own timeline and to their optimal orbit position. That means they start making revenue from their satellites faster, and they make higher quality revenue because the functionality is maximized. Neutron will eventually be able to deploy whole constellations of small satellites for exceedingly low costs. The Neutron also has enough power for human spaceflight. Rocket Lab says that the fairings and upper stage can be swapped out for a crew capsule, and the Neutron could eventually be sending people into Earth orbit as well. Rocket Lab is aiming to start building structures and test firing engines for Electron in 2022, with a first launch target of 2024. Now we know that in the aerospace world, timelines are constantly evolving and hardly anything ever keeps to schedule. But if Rocket Lab can at least keep pretty close to schedule, then they are going to be well ahead of most of their competition with what they can offer and have a pretty good shot at becoming just the second company ever to land an orbital rocket booster, and I think that is really going to blow people's minds if it can happen. Let us know what you think. Can Rocket Lab live up to their own hype, and are there any other aerospace startups we should be talking about? Let us know in the comment section below. Please don't forget to leave an offering to the algorithm gods and give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. We've got two more videos up there on the screen that you'd probably enjoy as well. Subscribe to this channel if you're not already for more space content and ring the little bell so you don't miss out. Thanks for watching the video today and we will see you next time.